Welcome back everyone. This week I'm tackling one of the most known unsolved cases in America. The tragic end of Elizabeth Short, better known as the Black Dahlia. We're going to examine her life, death, and the running theories behind what really happened to her and who may be responsible. So sit back, relax, and let's dive in. On January 15, 1947, a mother taking her child for a walk in Lemurk Park, a neighborhood in Los Angeles, stumbled upon a gruesome sight. The body of a young woman sliced clean in half at the waist. The body was posed in such a way that at first glance she thought it was a mannequin. Despite the extensive mutilation and cuts found on the body, not a single drop of blood was found at the scene. The LAPD began their investigation into the victim. They discovered through fingerprints the victim was a 22-year-old Hollywood hopeful named Elizabeth Short, better known as the Black Dahlia. Elizabeth Short was born on July 29, 1924 in Hyde Park, Massachusetts. Shortly after she was born, they moved to Medford, Massachusetts. Her father, Cleo Short, designed miniature golf courses for a living. In 1929, the Great Depression happened and his business failed. Cleo abandoned his wife Phoebe and their five daughters by faking his own suicide. Phoebe raised the girls alone by working multiple jobs. Cleo would write Phoebe apologizing and explain he lived in California now. He begged her to let him return, but she declined his offer. When Elizabeth became older, her father offered her to come stay with him and pursue her acting dream and stating she could stay until she was stable. Elizabeth jumped at the opportunity and moved to Vallejo, California in early 1943. Not long after, Cleo kicked Elizabeth out due to her laziness and poor dating habits. In late 1943, she took a job as a cashier at the Post Exchange at Camp Cook. She quickly became noted by the servicemen. She was emotionally vulnerable and wanted a relationship that would lead to marriage. During her time as a cashier, the advances of the men made her uncomfortable, so she left. She then moved to Santa Barbara with a friend. During her time there, she got into some legal trouble on September 23, 1943 for underage drinking. Rather than arresting Elizabeth, police arranged for her to go back to Massachusetts. This would not last long, however, and she would return back to California, but this time she would land right in Tinseltown. In Los Angeles, she met a pilot named Gordon Fickling and fell in love. Elizabeth felt that he was what she was looking for in a husband. Their romantic affair would be halted when Fickling was deployed to Europe. She spent her time taking modeling jobs but could not land any acting gigs. She felt so discouraged by her career, she went back to Medford to spend time with her family before moving to Miami with other relatives. During this time, Elizabeth focused on her dating life and continued to find suitors, specifically servicemen. She again fell in love with another pilot. His name was Matt Gordon, who promised to marry her. Tragedy struck the young couple. Matt was killed in action, leaving Elizabeth heartbroken once again. Elizabeth mourned her loss, but once again returned to Hollywood. She left L.A. on December 8, 1946, on a bus to San Diego. While staying here, she befriended a woman named Dorothy French, who worked at the Aztec Theater. Dorothy provided Elizabeth with a place to stay since she lacked employment at the time. Beth took work as a housekeeper for the family and continued her lifestyle of parties and dating. Through the family, she met a salesman from L.A. named Robert Manley. Both claimed they never had an intimate relationship, but Robert was attracted to her. The two would spend time off and on for weeks until Elizabeth decided to return to L.A. Manley decided to take Elizabeth back to L.A. and picked her up on January 8, 1947. The two went to a party that evening and spent it together. Manley left early the next day due to a prior appointment. He returned at noon to continue the journey. Upon arrival, Beth told Manley that her sister was at the Biltmore Hotel and she wished to see her. Manley dropped Beth off at the hotel, but did not wait due to another appointment he had. Manley last saw her making phone calls in the lobby. Robert Manley and the hotel staff were the last people to see Elizabeth Short alive. As far as the LAPD knew, her murderer was the only person to see her after January 9, 1947. Elizabeth was missing from the Biltmore Hotel for six days before her body turned up in the vacant lot on January 15, 1947. Now that we know a little bit more about Elizabeth and her whereabouts the last few days that she was alive, let's pick up where we began. The housewife, 
Betty Bersinger was on her way to the shoe repair shop that morning with her three-year-old daughter. She mistaked Elizabeth for a mannequin, but on closer inspection realized it was in fact a mutilated corpse. She ran to the nearest home and phoned the police. LAPD arrived and noticed peculiar things about the scene. Her body had been posed in a specific way. The arms were raised over her head and legs spread open in a twisted display of dis seduction. She had cuts and abrasions across her body and eerily her mouth had been slit from ear to ear as if she were smiling. Investigators theorized she had been bound and tortured for days due to rope marks on her neck, wrist, and ankles. No blood was found on her or the grass beneath, meaning she had been killed elsewhere and then dumped in the vacant lot. The leading investigators were Sergeant Harry Hansen and Finnis Brown. The horrible nature of the crime made it priority and gripped the attention of the media. Reporters and civilians alike moved in and out of the crime scene, destroying any possible evidence that was left behind. The body was quickly removed and moved to the county morgue. Prints were lifted and submitted to the FBI. Through her job at Camp Cook and her arrest, police were able to properly identify the body as Elizabeth Short. An autopsy was performed, but not much was found from it. Beth received so many injuries and no bodily fluids were found due to the body being washed. Numerous cuts and a crisscross pattern were made over her pubic area and all pubic hair had been removed by hand. Most of the damage seemed to be done post-mortem, which included the severing of the torso at the waist. The coroner determined Elizabeth's cause of death was hemorrhage and shock due to concussion of the brain and lacerations of the face. As stated previously, the case gained a lot of attention from the media. Usually the LAPD and the Herald Express paper worked together, but this case caused a shift in the relationship. The paper, who had, had good reporters, had valuable information about Elizabeth, but it came at a price for the LAPD. Desperate for leads, they relented. Through the paper, Phoebe Short, her mother, was found. They also received a lot of anonymous tips and reports, some of which actually panned out, such as discovering a trunk Elizabeth carried that had pictures of herself, friends, and lovers. Her life began to be illustrated through pictures, and police finally began to put a life to the victim. On January 17, 1947, Elizabeth's picture would be printed on the cover of the Herald Express, naming her the Black Dahlia, a moniker that would stick for more than 70 years. Police believe that Beth knew her killer beforehand. They felt this way due to the extreme mutilation the body endured and due to the way she was put on display for the public. The whole scene warranted an emotional attachment. It was as if the murderer wanted the world to see Beth for who she truly was or for any wrongdoing she may have caused them. On January 23, 1947, a paper called The Examiner received a call from a man claiming to be the murderer. He claimed to be upset with the way the story was being told and offered to mail her belongings to the paper for proof of his identity. The paper received a package which included a letter made from magazine clippings from an anonymous sender. The letter read, I will give up in Dahlia killings if I get 10 years. Don't try to find me. Along with the letter was Beth's birth certificate, business cards, photographs, and address book. The same day the package was delivered, Beth's handbag and shoe were found in a trash can only a few miles from the lot where her body was found. The discovery of these items gave new insight about the murderer. It meant they most likely lived within walking distance of the scene. Most letters would arrive along with a flood of tips, most of which were hoaxes. All evidence was turned over to the LAPD. All letters received seemed to be from the killer. The messages were convoluted and confusing and seemed to be a taunt to the LAPD. Detectives spent hours trying to decipher these messages. They were not dealing with an amateur. The murderer doused everything sent to the LAPD with gasoline to erase any fingerprints. The nature of the body also led the police to believe the murderer had medical training. So the FBI started scouting the students attending the medical and dental schools in the area. The first arrested suspect was Robert Manley. He was the last person to see Beth alive. Due to his alibi being solid and passing two lie detector tests, he was cleared. At this point, anyone who knew Elizabeth was considered a suspect. By June 1947, police processed and eliminated a list of 75 suspects, and by December 1948, 192 suspects had been considered. Now, let's take a minute to look at some of the theories that have been proposed over the years. 
During the time of Elizabeth's murder, many other young women began to turn up dead. The LAPD suspected a serial killer and began to call him the Riverside Phantom or Red Lipstick Killer. These are some of the women that police believe are victims of the Riverside Phantom. Gianna French, found February 1947, nude and in a vacant lot. She had been bludgeoned, strangled, and showed signs of torture. Written on her body in red lipstick were the initials BD. Police believe that this was a link between this victim and the Black Dahlia murder. She was last seen in downtown Hollywood bars. Laura Trellstad, found May 1947, nude, strangled with a strip of cloth, bludgeoned and dumped in a vacant lot near oil rigs, after last being seen intoxicated in the bar. Evelyn Winters, found nude and beaten in March 1947 in a vacant lot two miles from downtown. She was last seen in the local bars. Rosenda Mondragon, found July 1947, naked in a gutter, approximately one mile from the winter scene. Strangled to death with stockings, and the body showed signs of torture. Could Elizabeth been just another unfortunate victim of this murderer's killing spree? Another theory suggests that the Black Dahlia killing was a cover-up by the LAPD. This theory has the least amount of backing as far as evidence, though. It was suggested that maybe Elizabeth had a romantic relationship with an elite, and to avoid the drama associated with her murder, the LAPD covered it up. And lastly, the most common theory is that Elizabeth was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and let her guard down around someone she felt she could trust. With the theories out of the way, let's get into the prime suspects of this case. Ed Burns. Ed Burns became a suspect by the writer of The Black Dahlia Solutions. The author spent years deciphering the cryptic letters sent to the Herald Express and the Examiner. It was proposed that during Elizabeth's time in the local bar, she came to know a man theorized to be Ed Burns. Ed had attended the USC School of Medicine and lived in LA's Harbor District. The two had hit it off well, but due to him not being handsome, Beth would refrain from dating or even bringing him into her social circle. This made identifying Ed very difficult. The author believes Ed committed suicide in 1947, exactly two months after Elizabeth's murder. A suicide note surfaced and read, To whom it may concern, I have waited for the police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killing, but have not. I am too much of a coward to turn myself in, so this is the best way out for me. I couldn't help myself for that or this. Sorry, Mary. The author believes that this note and others received in the Black Dahlia case all held hidden messages. The note was not signed, but after deciphering, the letters show the name Ed Burns. When Ed's body was discovered, police were able to identify him to an unknown man featured in some of Beth's photographs. George Hodel Hodel was a doctor who was under police scrutiny in October of 1949 when he was accused of molesting his daughter. He was acquitted of these charges in December, but due to the case, he was included on the Black Dahlia suspect list. LAPD put Hodel under surveillance from February to March in 1950. They installed two microphones in his home and had 18 detectives monitoring them at all times. On February 19, 1950, their efforts paid off. The detectives picked up something horrific in the recordings. This is what the transcript said. 8.25 p.m. Woman screamed. Woman screams again. Woman was not heard prior to the scream. Later the same day, he was recorded talking to his confidant. Realized there was nothing I could do. Put a pillow over her head and cover her with a blanket. Get a taxi. Expired 1259. They thought there was something fishy. Anyway, now they may have figured it out. Killed her. Supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia. They couldn't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary anymore. She's dead. Due to the nature of the recording, the police began to investigate into the death of his secretary, Ruth Spaulding. Ruth had died from a drug overdose, but this did not write Hodel off as a suspect. He was present when she died and even burned some of her belongings before the police were called. The case ended up being dropped due to lack of evidence. 
Documents would later be found that indicated Spalding was planning to blackmail Hodel in regard to his ill medical practices, such as misdiagnosing and billing patients for unnecessary procedures and medications. Lieutenant Frank Jemison of LAPD wrote a report to the grand jury in February 1951. It notes a woman named Lillian DeNorick, who lived with Hodel. Lillian ID'd Elizabeth as one of Hodel's girlfriends at the time. She also stated that Hodel had spent a lot of time at the Biltmore Hotel, the same place Beth had gone missing from. George Hodel died in 1999, but in 2003, Steve Hodel, his son, published a book called Black Dahlia Avenger, A Genius for Murder. He claims his father was, in fact, the man who killed the Black Dahlia, plus other unsolved murders at the time. Steve, a former LAPD homicide detective, started the investigation into his own father when he came across two photos in his father's album that bore a strong resemblance to Elizabeth Short. The Short family insists the photos are not her. One photo was debunked to not be Elizabeth, but one of George's other women. The other still remains unidentified. After reviewing all the proposed evidence in the book, the deputy DA Stephen Kay believed the Dahlia murder had been solved, treating Hodel's words as facts rather than hunches. Regardless of the mixed opinions, Steve Hodel maintains his claim and operates a website where he continues to update information about the case. Leslie Dillon Leslie was a 27-year-old bellhop and an aspiring writer. He had previously worked as a mortician's assistant. He came under the radar of the investigation when he wrote the LAPD psychiatrist Dr. J. Paul DeRiver about the Dahlia murder, wanting to hear his theories due to his interest in sadism and sexual psychopaths. He wanted to write a book on the subject. Leslie never confessed to the murder, but claimed Jeff Connors, a friend, killed Elizabeth Short. DeRiver and Dylan would write back and forth. DeRiver began to believe Connors was not a real person and actually believed Dylan was the one who killed Elizabeth. He theorizes Connor was a figment of his imagination to cope with the gruesome act. In December 1948, Dylan agreed to meet with Dr. DeRiver. The conversations were recorded by him. Dylan mentioned questionable things such as how to bleed a body prior to embalming. He also took the police to meet Jeff Connors, but lo and behold, Jeff couldn't be found anywhere. Frustrated, the LAPD confronted Dylan, trapping him in hopes of a confession. He did eventually offer intimate details about the short murders that the investigators even had trouble explaining. Dylan was held against his will, which violated his constitutional rights. He was taken into custody on January 10, 1949. They questioned him that night and brought him in front of a grand jury, but due to police error, he was not tried. The following day, LAPD received a call from the San Francisco police stating they'd found Connors, only his real name was Artie Lane. Artie lived in L.A. at the time of Short's murder and was a maintenance man at Columbia Studios, a common hangout spot for Short. By 1949, Leslie Dillon was no longer a suspect due to lack of evidence. LAPD concluded he was most likely in San Francisco at the time of the murder. Even though they couldn't account for his whereabouts during the days Beth was still considered missing. There were a lot of suspects that the LAPD considered, but due to lack of evidence, most leads were a dead end. Officially, no one has been charged in the death of Elizabeth Short. And to this day, her murder remains unsolved. The tragic end of the Hollywood socialite has perplexed law enforcement and the public for years. Short's mysterious death birthed many films and books, all attempting to tell her story and finally put an end to the tale. Currently, the FBI has 211 public files regarding the case. All records are not public, yet. Until then, the truth about Elizabeth Short's untimely demise may never be known, continuing the prolific mystery of the Black Dahlia. Hey guys, thanks for taking the time out of your week to join me. I remember first learning about the Black Dahlia case and just how much it intrigued me. I I believe I can credit this case for my interest in unsolved murders. And you know, even to this day, it's crazy because it's so notable that we still continue to talk about it even 70 years later. The tragic conclusion of this tale has forever scarred the reputation of Tinseltown, and we will never forget the horrible fate of the Black Dahlia. So as always, thanks again guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!